Hey guys, welcome back to Rewild, where we talk environment, psychology, and other interesting things. And today is another one of those like organized, decluttered, planning productivity type posts. So today I wanted to chat with you folks about how I do my planning um, and ways that you might want to implement this in your own life to increase your productivity and improve your lifestyle overall. So just a short introduction, you know, if you're here, you probably already know, but for some of us, it's great to have a little reminder that when you plan your life out, even down to like how you plan your day or how you plan the next couple of hours, it can really make a huge difference in just being more mindful in the direction that you're going in life. So I am a big proponent of planning. I won't say that I'm perfect at it. Um, I'll kind of let you guys know the areas that I'm still growing in. Um, but I wanted to just kind of do a quick overview of how I like to plan and how I set that up annually um, and throughout different quarter points of the year. And to also discuss a little bit about our human perception of time and how we can use that to our advantage to be more productive and proactive people. So the first thing that I want to say about planning that is like a personal struggle of mine is when you set a goal, it's nice for it to be a SMART goal. Um, and I'll list that acronym SMART goal. They're pretty famous, but basically having them be specific, time bound, achievable, um, very like kind of meticulous and, and specific. You know, the more specific that you are, um, the more... I think honed in and easier it is to know exactly what you're going to do. Another thing that I've noticed uh, that chat GPD does with me a little bit when I use it for self-help stuff is um, it's such a great exercise. It'll ask like, how are you going to implement this? And I think that's a really nice way to kind of get from aspirational self to real world action self when you are looking at the way you intend to go about it. Another really cool tip or um, perspective that I got from the media theorist, um, Brendan Burchard, I don't know what you should call him. He's like a self-help guy, I guess. Um, but Brendan Burchard wrote High Performance Habits and has the HPX journal, which is like a very cool day planner that I like to use sometimes. And one of the questions in that journal that I always appreciate for your day-to-day -day start is it asks um what are your challenges today like like what do you foresee is going to like stop you up and how are you going to address it and i think that's such a nice powerful reminder especially to apply to each and every one of our individual goals that for every goal that we set there's going to be an obstacle and you can kind of work around that like preemptively anticipating that some light examples of this are um, setting yourself little reminders like laying out your workout clothes. So first thing in the morning when you're on the way to the gym or when you're getting out of bed, you see those clothes and you pop them on. And if you start to just whittle away at your own resistance by laying things out the night before and making that your first step, all of a sudden you're just sort of starting to get into that locomotion like movement of um, running on your motivation that is already set in motion so that can be a very powerful process just like as an intro to planning to not just set a goal and have a plan but once you set the goal sit down and go okay and what does this look like you know if i want to execute on playing guitar every day where do i store my guitar so it's like visible and noticeable you know how often do i trim my fingernails and where do i keep picks and how am I going to keep it fresh for myself? How much is the amount that is attainable but still impressive for me at the stage that I'm at right now? So things like that are really important. You know, I think a lot of us, at least myself personally, I'll set a goal and I'll audit it later and I'll notice if it's not happening. Usually it's because it's either too vague or I haven't really thought out what accomplishing it looks like in a logistical way. Or there's a barrier of some kind to, um, for me, I have like a mild injury that flares up once in a while, and that's actually a barrier to getting into the gym in the morning. And so recently I've started going to PT, even though it's a really old injury, and I have a pretty good gym routine anyway. And I'm realizing that on those days I feel kind of sore to get to the gym, it's because I need to do more like yoga and alignment work first to kind of warm my body up. So that's a good simple example 
Another one might be, you know, breakfast and hydration before you get started at work every morning. There might be certain patterns and habits that you want to set for yourself. And if they're not happening, it's important to ask yourself, like, what are the barriers and how can I preemptively take them away from myself? You know, maybe I lose my keys on the way to the work or gym or something. And, you know, it means having a hook for the keys that you see every day, especially for people who struggle with like, neurodivergent executive function stuff if you have ADHD or if you use the internet a lot it can also kind of mimic those symptoms um, making your life really easy by design and by easy I mean like laying out the things that you want to remind yourself to do sometimes or thinking about what's stopping you and if it's like a physical some you know if you're not playing guitar because you store a big heavy suitcase in front of the doorway that the, the guitarist, you know what I mean? Like there's certain things you might um, have obstacles for that you're not quite conscious of. And so if you become conscious of those, instead of beating yourself up for not doing the goal, then you will end up um, having more success in setting yourself up for success um, or setting yourself up not to fail. So let's get into time-based goals planning and scheduling. I'm not sure if I'm going to upload this before or after New Year's, but we're right around the New Year's season. And I like to plan based on our typical kind of calendars. Occasionally, I'll plan based on things like the Hawaiian moon calendar and the Celtic wheel of the year. I talked about that in a Yule episode recently. But I will also plan based on five and 10 year periods, one year periods, quarters, months, weeks, and days. So I wanted to get into what that looks like and a couple of tips and tricks around that as well. Um, so the first thing I want to remind people is if you want to start planning in terms of like both your long-term and your short-term goals in a time-bound way, which I really recommend, one thing is to keep it a little bit limited. So in past episodes, I've talked about habit stacking where it really helps to kind of maybe only have one thing you're working on per quarter for me personally. I, I was like a chronic student for years and years. So like usually I think about my habits in terms of quarters. So maybe one quarter I'm focusing on writing, another quarter I'm focusing on content, another quarter I'm focusing on language or guitar. And so I'll try to keep those themes in a way where I'm not just stacking like five new habits, although I have been guilty of that, but like ideally not stacking too many things all at once for you to upheaval your whole life. And I talk about that in this year's New Year's episode, just, you know, being gentle with ourselves with like how much change we pressure onto ourselves in our self-improvement journey that, you know, it's really best to succeed at something small than to fail at trying to do everything. So I tend to separate my quarters in this way. And at maximum, sometimes like two month periods where there's sort of like a theme of like a specific thing that is the most important. From research and psychology, I've found most of us are able to focus on about up to five things. So it's good to have like your number one thing every day that is like the thing. And that'll help you feel really accomplished if you can narrow it down that way. And then I find like up to about five things is kind of like the max that makes sense for me personally to focus on at any given time. So that might be improving my relationships, improving my health and workout routines, um, making strides in my business and getting outside more and maybe learning a language. And then that's it. Maybe we're not focusing on guitar that quarter as much because we have all these other things going on, right? So um, for you, maybe you're studying for the bar, maybe you're in nursing school, maybe you are a professor or um, you're launching a business and you have a specific goal in mind that requires that kind of focused chunk of time, then really like let that be the highlight of your quarter. And you can do that for the month as well. You can do that for any period of time. Um, For me personally, I really specifically focus on this for days, like the theme of the day, the number one accomplished thing I need to do that day. And also for quarters, because for, I find personally, these are the most important um, quantities of time for me to have like a specific focus for accomplishing something. As far as months go, um, I try to kind of plan beyond the month because I just feel like 
months can get chaotic and weeks a little bit too, to some extent. I think it might be because I use both Gregorian and Hawaiian moon calendars. So the Hawaiian moon calendar week is three weeks or on a Hulu is what we call like the equivalent of a week. It's like three per month. And then the moon cycle is different. So like for me personally, like I, I think in my mind, like I have too many of those different um, astrological rotations going on in terms of how I quantify time in my life. But quarters work really well. You know, they go along with the fall seasons and then, you know, the sun rises and sets every day. So that for me is like a very natural rhythm to be in. Weeks and months actually are divergent to some degree from like the um, lunar and uh, solar cycles. If you nerd out about like archaeo astrology or archaeo astronomy kind of stuff. God, this is getting nerdy. I didn't intend for this to be so nerdy today. Um, but that was my long-winded explanation for why those are my number one thing time periods out of the year. Year planning is really cool too. And especially while we're on the new year, I think that's like a great time to sit down and think about like, what is my year theme and where do I slot that into my quarterly plan? Um, so annually, and it doesn't have to be New Year's, by the way, like I think it's important for you to choose your annual planning. Like for some people, it might be the fiscal year. If you're a teacher, maybe it starts or ends in like August or May. You know, maybe you have a, a holy holiday or maybe you're from Asia and your new year starts in February. So really just any time during the year that is like your annual time is the perfect time to plan out all of the other smaller increments of time for what you hope to accomplish. Another um, thing I promised we would talk about is like the psychological impacts of how we weight time based on like what's more productive. And what I mean by that is like we have two specific examples here that I think help people to kind of kick it into high gear and or be more gentle with themselves in having a successful goal accomplishment process. The first one is this interesting wisdom I heard recently that we will accomplish so much more than we ever expected in five years. And we tend to overestimate what we think we can do in a single year. And so the way I want you to use that piece of information is to be a little bit humble with like your annual goals, you know, put in quarterly check-ins with yourself. If you feel like your annual goal is a little too ambitious, one of the ways that you can prevent that from happening is really focusing on your quarterly goals as if they are just as important, if not more important, or your monthly goals, because that's going to help you to really like check in with yourself throughout the year and modify your goal. I talk about this in my New Year's resolutions episode, like it's so important to modify your goal based on progress. So if you know that you're failing at a deadline, if you know that it's not working out, don't just be like, oh, I failed. I suck. I'm going to go crawl under a rock and just call it a day. Like, no, like, you know, look at that gently and go, hmm, what happened? What are my obstacles? Was I too ambitious? You know, did I say I had to practice? I'm using guitar a lot. This, I think this is one of my goals for 2024, guys. Like, did I say I have to practice guitar 40 minutes a day? You know, or can I just start with like five to 20 instead? Right? Like if I, if I set a goal too high, maybe it's more likely to fail. So that's another thing to just keep in mind that one year goals, don't take them so seriously because we overestimate what we can do in a year. We put a lot of annual pressure on ourselves apparently, um, but do plan your five year stuff and update your five and 10 year plans annually and really um, have a lot of faith and foresight into that five year window because that is actually the window where apparently people tend to accomplish a lot more and really blossom. So maybe one, you know, maybe you have a bigger goal, but like one year is just like kind of preparing it and making that soil fertile. And in fact, like it doesn't pop until like three years in, you know, or something like that. So it's important to remember that for the human lifespan, those five year increments of time can be really, really powerful for personal growth and not to get too fixated on annual time cycles because we tend to overestimate those. So that's one trick of how we perceive time that hopefully can help you accelerate and propel your goals forward. And then the other one that I hate, I hate this, I hate it, but I, apparently it's medicine I need to swallow, um, is your lifetime in weeks. Oh, guys, it makes you feel so 
small and vulnerable and like just ready to die if you look at your lifetime in weeks there's actually like little calculators that can help you x them all out based on how old you are it's a little macabre frankly but that's what makes it so effective is when you look at your lifetime in weeks for me personally and for most people who look at that graph it's so shocking how small a lifetime is and it really wakes you up to the fact that you know, time can really slip through our fingers if we are not more mindful of how we're using it. Um, a, a special example that I'd like to use is for those of us who are not living our dreams. And that doesn't mean you have to quit your job and go be an influencer or whatever, but like it does mean, you know, for myself, like playing guitar, yeah, I'm not going to get paid for it. That's not my job. And so it gets backburnered and backburnered. But you know, f coming from an alternative therapy perspective, um, especially like art therapy and psychology, um, we need certain creative outlets. You know, if there's something you're very passionate about in life that's not really your career, like gardening or, you know, uh, ex cave exploring or whatever, like make sure that you are making time in your plan to do that. And honestly, I feel like life in weeks is kind of one of those hard truth, like, diagrams that really awaken you to that that you don't want to wait till you're old and retired to live your dreams really you want to build a life where they have at least a little bit of space in your day or in your week for the things that bring you joy similarly i think um the same also applies for family and friend time you know like cultivating your friendships and your relationships um there's a great uh I don't know if it's a call, if you should call it research, but it's like a survey of the top 10 regrets of the dying. And something that I find like really interesting that's across the board for the top 10 regrets of the dying that are typical for people is that nobody really um, regrets like like nobody feels like nobody feels like they needed to work more in their life when they're on their deathbed. It's very common, in fact, for a lot of people to mention that they worked too much and they didn't spend enough time with loved ones and family. So, um, sorry, I got, a, I got a distraction on the screen. Um, but, you know, that's something that we can also kind of look at when we're looking at our life in weeks and we're seeing how finite and mortal we are. Um, I think it's important to realize that that diagram scary as it can be can also kind of be a kick in the pants reminder to focus on what's important because you know your life really is going by and not not in a bad way you know if we live in the moment if we're meditating if we're living it how we truly want to that's great um but i think life in weeks for me personally is like a reminder that you shouldn't wait to be living you know you shouldn't wait until your next day off to go to that park you've always wanted to go to you know, do it in the afternoon after work or something like really try to schedule in your life things that truly matter. And actually, since I mentioned it, I really recommend go look up the top 10 regrets of the dying. I'll um, put a link to it below and like plan your life around some of those things, you know, like look at what elderly um, in Hawaii, we call them kupuna, our wise elders. Look what our wise elders have said about how they wish they spent their time and really apply that to like your daily, weekly, monthly plans in terms of honoring that um, trend in the human condition that, you know, a lot of us look back on our lifetimes and feel like we spent a little bit too much time, I don't know, troubleshooting broken computers and maybe not enough time with our kids or focusing on art and things that feed our soul. So I know it's a little cheesy, a little hokey, but it's true. Um, and I feel like life in weeks is that. And especially also for those of us who have big dreams about things we want to do, you know, books we want to write, um, trips we want to take, like, you know, those big aspirational things that never seem to like get done fast enough um, or can easily get backburnered. Looking at life in weeks is another way to kind of like shake yourself out of it um, and see that, you know, maybe you should take it next summer and not wait um, if you can whatever whatever it is that you've been waiting to do for years like do it now or never so that's most of the wisdom and then there's one last little piece of advice for this that uh i'm bad at <laughs> so maybe you and i we can we can work on it together because once you make your quarterly annual and weekly plans a lot of us just sort of put it in a drawer and forget about it until we wake up and realize oh my god I meant to write that book and it's not published yet. 
what was my plan again? You know? Um, <laughs> so if you have ADHD, you can relate. I'm not diagnosed, but sometimes I wonder. Um, so definitely in addition to scheduling your goals and use, use a day planner, use um, Google Calendar is great. Uh, Google Calendar and Todoist are really nice because you can automate like, I want this to happen quarterly. I want this to happen weekly. So it's so easy now to put in these um, time-based uh, cyclical reminders to ourselves. But um, also put in reminders to review your plan. And so this is kind of my growth area at this season of my life is I've gotten very good at making these plans. But I notice sometimes I only review the ones from before when I'm sitting down to either do damage control because I've recognized I've fallen off course or I'm sitting down to replan the next quarter or whatever. And I haven't really learned how to schedule in that review time. So that review time is really important. That's my personal goal for this season. And um, that's my recommendation to you for you just to jump ahead to that step that is often forgotten and unsung. So go ahead and try this out. Um, I recommend like one really easy way you can do this again is just to pop on Google Calendar or um, a free app like Todoist. Or if you use a paper calendar, you can you can do it that way too. But go ahead and just put it in there. You know, if Sunday is your day off and that's your favorite like chill day, um, let Sunday be your weekly planning day. Um, or maybe Thursday is when you have a sitter for the kids and Thursday is a good weekly planning day, something like that. And really ask yourself, like, what is the best time of the day, time of the week, time of the month, time of the quarter, time of the year, a time every five years that I want to um, re reassess and rewrite these plans. And then either make that same day your review day as well, or go ahead and schedule it yet again for a review and assessment day. So I know that sounds like a lot of work to some, but for me, this process has been so life changing. Like, I feel so much more in control of my journey in life and where I'm going and my progress. And so I, I want that for you. And even though it sounds like a lot of homework, um, really, if you're using an automated calendar schedule, it's not. It'll take you five minutes, not the planning part, but the scheduling part, at least. Um, and you don't have to take long on these plans either. Like sometimes simplicity is beautiful. You know, maybe it's just five bullets of what you want to focus on at first and you can develop that more over time but i feel like these time-based check-ins um they can do wonders for helping you to really check in and be honest with yourself about how you're using your time and if it is in alignment with your life goals and your values so that's it for this week we'll see you next time thank you for tuning in and for supporting the station and i hope you have a wonderful planning cycle however long that is take care